was born in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1919. My mother had passed a couple, a little, almost two years later, at birth of a sister. So I kind of changed family, family life. But my dad's work took us from Cleveland to, took him to the Chicago area. But fortunately, my brother and sister and I uh, were housed with a family out west of Chicago. And I say that was good because the school wasn't segregated. There weren't enough blacks wow. in town. So, so education continued at, at a good level. But a couple of things happened at that time that, looking back, I still say as a part of my experience, and besides parents and grandparents saying, you know, always treat other people like you want to be treated, I had a chance to share in the Boy Scout program. And I say even today, if everybody lived under the Scout Oath and the 12 Scout Laws, we'd have a different country for, for, for sure. But, but that, that was, uh, I'd say, I think an influence on me some, but when I graduated from high school, I worked a year or two, well, and I had my dad's work took him to Iowa, and that was good. Iowa schools were excellent, too. For him. What part of Iowa? Uh, down Keokuk, the south Keokuk. East, southeast corner. You can't get any farther because if you cross the bridge, you're in the... <laughs> You're out of Iowa. <laughs> my mom grew up in a little town, uh, Clinton, Iowa. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, I don't know how far that is. I know of <laughs> Keokuk. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, it was quite an experience. In fact, I always laugh, too, because I learned to swim and, there in some place. That's how I said, well, if you tried to stand up, that bottom was kind of muddy, so you <laughs> get yourself back up there. <laughs> But those were good years because then my dad's work took it back to Chicago, in Chicago, and that was terrible because schools were highly segregated, and and it's one of the problems I see in schooling today. So schools are so different, They're not keeping our youngsters up in so many cases where they should be. I didn't do anything for several weeks because the school was that far behind. Especially in the military. Yeah. Uh, we see that with military kids a lot where yeah. they're ahead in one curriculum right. and then two years later they switch duty stations and then they're behind, behind or because, they're way ahead. Yeah, yes, because that does happen. But, um, um, but the, I worked a year to get enough money to go to college. Of course, back then, state school. So, so Illinois, I went to the University of Illinois. And that's where I got... ROTC, Pershing Rifles, really enjoyed that training. But uh, when I look at service and, and really look back, they ask about how did I get into flying because I had never aspired to say, I want to do that someday or had been around aircraft. Um, because I was in school, my draft board wasn't pulling my number. Occasionally they did as necessity, and that was a had I been pulled, I'm sure it would have been uh, with the rifle on the ground in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I learned about the flying program, and this is one of the interesting things at the time. I wasn't aware of how restricted the military was at that time because of a 1925 war card study that said we were physically qualified to do service work, but mentally inferior and, and wouldn't qualify or do well in any technical area, such as flying. And, and the, because of the Army policy, so also in 1939, they had started the civilian pilot training program because of our declaring to support our allies in Europe. Um, and well, the country had come out of 10 years of depression. It didn't change segregation, but everybody was in some of the job opportunities of the war build up. Sure. And, and wh wh what that meant, meant at that time. Um, but uh, in fact, I think it was even here in Washington, D.C., um, 
Howard University had the civilian policy. They located colleges around the country. And a young man got his pilot's wings there and went next door to say he wanted to be an Army pilot. And the Army said, can't use a black pilot because we don't have any black mechanics. And they would say, guess what they said? They said, mixing wow. of the races and war wouldn't, wouldn't work uh, at all. Um, so um, the pressure's on, the needs are still building up, and the Army policy, well, we studied the issue, we know it's not going to be successful. But pressures said, uh, we'll, we'll authorize a squadron, 99th Pursuit Squadron, with all of its necessary support. Because of their policy of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, the first were mechanics that they trained at Chinook Field, ran to the Illinois Technical School. And of course, that's 14 miles from the university location. We were aware of something's going on because they got blacks in training. Uh, they were in the mechanical training. Uh, and I guess my ROTC instructor said, well, you know, they got a pilot program too. And I went and took the exams and passed it, and although I hadn't said that's what I want to do, it was just of interest to me because I was interested in engineering and sure. that type of approach. And uh, like this was like in the spring of, I think, April of 42. Um, sat around waiting, waiting. Finally, in October, got the call. I entered the service as a cadet, no boot camp or anything directly to go to, to, to pilot training. And all I can say is that after my first flight in that PT 17, I was hooked <laughs> to be able to loop roll the way I could go, loop roll and spin, come back and put your feet on the ground. Nothing like it. Um, wow. And that was my first experience with uh, aviation and flying, but as I say, I was hooked and, and thoroughly enjoyed all of my experiences in flying. And made myself available to fly. Well, I, although uh, I ended up graduating in June of 43, entered the 302nd Fighter Squadron, but because of liking to fly if they needed an aircraft 15 or 20 minutes after maintenance before going back on land, I was there wow. flying. I was, every opportunity I had to get in, <laughs> I was there. And the same thing, uh, I flew the other aircraft. Uh, they had C-47 for support, occasionally picking up supplies or taking people to the school. I'm a pilot. <laughs> wow, you just jump in wherever you could. Wherever I could. And my, back then, I'd say, crew chief and started, I can fly it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, so it, it started out what would be a wonderful career for me. And I don't have the answers, you know, why me, how. I don't know, because I, I didn't ask for anything, but I kept getting good assignments. I actively flew 27 of my 30 years. Doesn't happen very often. Unbelievable. And they'll say, why or how? I don't know. I didn't ask for anything, but I kept getting assignments. And what's of interest, too, in, in the program and why the service of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, Airmen are so important, as I say, the 99th was successful. Um, they needed, of course, replacement pilots, so training continued at Tuskegee, and uh, they were ended up with three additional single-engine fighter squadrons, 100, 301st, and, and 302nd. Those three became the 332nd fighter group. <coughs> 99th went into combat. All of us were trained first in the P-40 Warhawk, uh, but only the 99th flew it in combat. Um, they were combat ready in December of 42. Um, the 99th was attached. I say they were combat ready in December of 42, but nobody wanted them. Finally, they continued their training for another three months, and finally in the spring of 
of 43, they uh, sent them to North Africa with all of their support, attached to the 33rd Fire Group, but not to their base. Yeah. Because you know, the segregation went overseas too. They sent a pilot over to the 33rd location to get their briefing, came back and flew. But uh, Colonel Womar, they're not aggressive, they only shot down one aircraft, said uh, be patrolling Liberia. Well, there weren't any Germans in Liberia, so you understand what he was doing. Excuse me. And, um, but that brought a hearing in Washington, and the study, though, that they did for the hearing, the 99th bombs on target was the same as the other squadrons. Um, stay, keep, stay in combat. Uh, 99th moved out of uh, so the North hear, Africa. The hearing was to determine whether whether we should stay in combat. Exactly. Wow. And Momar and the, and the upper level folks weren't for the integration, but because of the need, contingent, the 99th moved out of North Africa into Sicily, out of Sicily into Italy. Um, this is... Uh, about uh, January of 44, um, the 332nd Fire Group was combat ready in the P-40, but they said, well, you are going to do some patrol work. And we were switched and still left training on site on time with the P-39. The, when the 99th was moving out of, of Sicily into Italy, the 332nd Fire Group arrived directly into Italy. So we were patrolling Naples Harbor with the P-39. 99 still doing interdiction and ground support. And I've always, looking back and looking at the history, said there was a bit of integration when the 99th moved out of uh, Sicily and Italy because with the 79th pilot group, Bill Bates was just said, glad to have more pilots and more aircraft. And over the Anzio Beach time frame, I think it was in, in the, couple weeks time frame, the 99 shot down more than a dozen German aircraft, so it was a matter yes. of opportunity. Well, and, and, <laughs> and if, if, had you not been there, so my, that was the exact same time that my grandpa was on the ground in Italy, and he was, he was in the 34th Infantry Division, so they were advancing on Casino. Oh my god. They goodness. were advancing on Casino, <laughs> and then after Casino, they were decimated, yes. his unit. And then they went to Anzio. They they refitted them, and then they went to Anzio. So he was in uh, Casino okay. and Anzio, oh same God. place you were. Yeah, the troops had to remove. Um, but in the spring of '44, uh, our bombers, of course, had moved out of North Africa and are flying from southern Italy. Thought we had enough guns on the B-17s and B-24s to protect them from the German forces. That wasn't the case. Sometimes half of the squadron, they send out 12 aircraft, six get back home. Jeez. But that was 10 lives Jeez. for every bomber lost. So they pulled four groups from 12th Tactical Air Force to move to 15th Strategic Air Force and begin the escort work. And the 332nd Fighter Group was one of the four. We gave the P-39 to the Russians, picked up P-47 Thunderbolts. You don't go to school back then. You just read the tech orders, sat in the cockpit, found the switches, and figured it out. Go <laughs> exactly, wow. and had to go. Um, and we had the P forty seven only about three months in July of forty four. All four groups were in there flying the P fifty one yeah. Mustang, and when the three thirty second got their P fifty ones, by that time the Germans were pretty well pushed out of Italy. They stopped attaching the 99th to white groups and assigned them to the 332nd. So we had four squadrons from, let's say, July 44 time frame on to the, just before the war ended, they ended up deactivating the 302nd, going back to a three squadron group. But, but in that time and on the major Missions each squadron put up 16 aircraft. So, wow. Yeah. A lot. And of course, the 51 was wonderful because it gave us 
speed range and altitude capability was just the best thing in there for the job. What what were, what were the major differences between the? Well, the P forty seven was fine, much more roomy cockpit, with that big radial engine, limited yeah. altitude, and and, range, and then built to how much fuel you could throw, the range. Range. Yeah. So, and and for X Corps in particular, the B seventeens flew a bit higher than the B-24s, and you, we'd like to be uh, be able to capability even fly above them. Sure. So the, the P-47 maneuvering and all uh, 28,000 feet wasn't too bad. P-51 would go 34, 35,000 feet, plus it had the range. You know, we built the aircraft for the English, and they put the Rolls Royce Merlin engine in it. <laughs> So that's always when folks say, what's your favorite aircraft? I say P-51, but qualified with the Rolls with the Royce, Rolls -Royce. Merlin engine. Wonderful, uh, pretty tight cockpit. I still, I don't have my watch on now, but I still wear my watch with the crystal on the inside because reaching down there to pull up the gear, I crap too. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> yeah. uh, but later, um, I ended up... Um, in Vietnam in reconnaissance, and I like that because we had they had, they had pretty good service watches in back that day, and with the throttle up here, um, I just turned my glove back and preferred looking out the window and looking my watch here rather than having to look down in the sure. cockpit <laughs> to, for timing. So it paid off to to me and. Do double ways, but but as time went on, as I said, I kept getting assignments. Uh, when the, and even when I came home, I was overseas from J January '44 to late November '44. Uh, finally, got a replacement, came back, and when I graduated in June of '43. Um, the instructor said, too bad they don't have a bomber program for you guys because I think you'd make a good bomber pilot. I didn't ask him what he meant by that, but we didn't know that they had already approved and three months later, medium bomber training began at Tuskegee Army Airfield um, with the Mitchell B-25. Yeah. And uh, so when we talk of Tuskegee Army today, although they talk about the Red Tails, which was our identification with 15th Air Force, um, that's just half of the work. But it was, uh, I believe, the Pittsburgh Courier published an article, I've forgotten the exact, it was during the war, but saying we were fighting for two victories victory against double victory, victory against Hitler in Europe, victor, victory against racism here at home. Because even though when we came home, nothing had changed here, when I came back, I ended up down at Tuskegee and, and was assigned to the Twin Engine School. But I'm happy because that's sure. still more flying and still doing it's the same things that, that, right, that, that, that I men mentioned earlier. But the bomb group uh, fought that battle against racism because Colonel Selway had General Hunter's okay, and all the Army regulations had, at that time had also <coughs> had already indicated, well, I think they, the rule then was there should be no segregation based on race, creed, or color, but it wasn't applied. It was written, but it wasn't being, being applied. Sure. But Colonel Selway had General Hunter's okay to say on his base, trainees could only use the facilities he designated, who's in training, black pilot for the 477. Oh, that's White Officers Club, you can't go there. And uh, you have to use building so-and-so. Well, officers of the 477 were fully aware of the uh, Army regulations. Plus, back then, your club dues were taken out of your pay rather than you being given the money you, you applied to club. It was automatic. So he was paying dues. They are paying dues, uh, and officers in twos and threes peacefully tried to enter the white club, were denied, 
Colonel Selway asked him to come in, reread his regulation, and sign a statement that they would abide. Uh, 101 refused and were shipped off from God, from not Godman Field, shipped to Godman Field, Kentucky, put behind barbed wire guards. All this that brought another hearing. I don't know what they did with Selway, but the army never changed the policy. The war was over, and this is 45. You know, time frame. Um, the army said, well, we'll have a composite group. We'll keep two of the B-25 squadrons. 99th and come home. We'll reactivate the 99th. And we'll call it the 477th composite group. Um, Godman Field, Kentucky, not the place. Oh, we'll open up Lockburn Air Base south of Columbus, Ohio segregated base. 46 when training ended, those of us there, where'd we go? Lockburn Air Base. Uh, 1947, the Air Force separated from the ground forces. So all through the war period, the Army never changed that policy that had become a part of Army or military mobilization. Sure. Um, the Air Force in their studies, although everybody wasn't for it, uh, determined that uh, they needed to use people based on training experience and where needed, not happenstance of birth. And they're not getting enough money to keep a base open, but limited to, to it, ability to assign them according to need. We need to integrate. A few months later, very courageous President Harry Truman issued an executive order, I believe it was 1981, mandating all the services need to integrate. Integrate, yeah. yeah. But the Air Force really led the country in that action by closing Logburn Air Base for early July 1949. And we were scattered around the world. And of course that brought some interesting times and everybody's story is probably a little bit different. My, uh, there was earlier, when I'd come home and said, you got to sometimes do something else other than just fly. Uh, some went to television school, weather school. I chose to go to aircraft maintenance also school. Same locations those mechanics were trained in. Okay. in Illinois. Around two of Illinois. So uh, I'm past that. So my assignments, be, and I guess you might say if many of my assignments, I'd be in the field, but get called down to have, we're in the materiel area, maintenance okay. and material support, which was good, and still flying, like I say, they had support aircraft, so nobody told me to quit, I guess. That's wonderful. <laughs> I was enjoying it, uh, so, uh, but my first uh, maintenance assignment, uh, the first integrated assignment was in maintenance. I was sent to Smoky Hill Air Base, Salina, Kansas, as officer in charge of base shops. There was a bomb group there. And, uh, but got along fine to work and on base, but I never got my family to Salina, Kansas back then because I couldn't buy or rent up the home. <laughs> You couldn't find a place, place right, to get they, the, nobody would rent rent a home for you. Exactly. Um, but uh, then they started closing many of the bases that had been up for the war support, and the, the bomb group was moved south. But why, without asking, I'd gotten the, my shop's equipment ready for shipment. I'd get orders to go still in maintenance. Uh, so, we had started the maintenance control programs. I ended up in Riverside, California, as officer in charge of the, uh, the maintenance control. <laughs> still, was still flying. <laughs> Nobody said quit flying. So I'm flying. Um, and your family was in. Your family was in Illinois. I was able to get the family, but there was and again no housing around Marchfield, and that was the day before military housing became a part of the military program, but fortunately on the far side of Riverside, there was a farmer had a couple homes on his property and 
and the home, so we got along fine uh, there. But um, were you married at this point? Were you? Yeah. Oh, that's the other thing I didn't say. I met a young lady on the campus at the University of oh, Illinois, okay. and during that period I mentioned I had taken the exams in the spring of 40, 42, but you know, still school, nothing happened. But going dating and all that, finally decided in October, still nothing had happened. Decided to go ahead and get married. Got married on a Saturday in October, and Monday morning's mail had a report. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but looking back, I think to me, excuse me, to me, that was to my benefit because in training, like we had a few hours off, maybe Saturday, Sunday. Um, my wife went south with me, and she worked for uh, with at the on the campus at the institute for the the medical doctor that was there. But I didn't have to be going to Atlanta or Montgomery looking for a girlfriend. Sure, <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Had a little time off. That's right. I, I was happy. So my focus again. Uh, what the training was all about. We had good training, they didn't change the standards. So, so I'd say, although I had no idea it would work that way, I think it, it was to my benefit. Wow. <laughs> and so how things can happen, you know, and that's what all I say now, life, excuse me, life's a blessing, because <laughs> things can happen, but not in your control or because you did something that happened. The Lord puts us in the right place at the right time, Some, as <laughs> as or the wrong place at the wrong, wrong time. time. But one way or another, we're where we're at, and yeah. we have to. Yeah. Have but to. but along the way, as I say, uh, sometimes folks up there ask me, talking to schools, say, "Well, how, how'd you put up with things like that?" And I said, uh, "You know, I learned you, you treat other people like you want to be treated." Going around with the chip on the shoulder never solved any problem. Somebody had a black eye or a bloody nose, but didn't change the situation. So you let those things. So to me, it was one thing that I always pass on is always be positive. You can look at the negative side of things, but you're looking in the wrong direction. Look at the positive side of things. There's beauty everywhere you go if you look for it, and there's ugly things. But Stay on the path. I think the old saying that I often pass the young folks, you know, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and don't mess with Mr. In Between. <laughs> and that became a thing. And well, I did, for some I enjoyed working with people. And one of the things that I learned to pass on to younger officers and occasions I've had to talk to groups and so and I said, you know, it, it's very nice if you're in any leadership role. It's very nice to have favorites, but don't let it show. You've got to treat everybody under you with the same res respect and so on. Because if they feel you're giving somebody else a favorite and not them, you're not going to get a hundred percent support from them. And I pass that on that uh, it's good to have favorites, but just don't let it show. If you're in leadership. You've got to treat everybody uh, the same. And I was glad that was one of the things that I looked at. Uh, my final assignment, I was commander of Richard Gabar Air Base in the 1840th Air Base Wing. But one day I went down the hangar, and there, here was a lone airman in the hangar doing some work, and I said, stop to chat with him a little bit. And as I was about to leave, he said, may I tell you something? I said, certainly. He said, first time in his service that a senior officer had come and talked to him. And that really hit home to me what it meant that, and, and allowed me to add support to the term of have favors, but don't let show, but treat everybody under with the same respect and, and realize that uh, 
That's the way you get 100% of whatever task you assign. You don't look at, is this good or bad or so on. If, if, you know, you said, I'll follow orders. But with the folks, in the, if, if you're in a leadership role, you have that additional responsibility to assure that uh, all in, under your control are treated equally and have the same respect. And then you can ask 100% from them. <laughs> well, the, the fact, I mean, that just speaks volumes about your, your character and your, your ability as a leader because you're, you're stressing and talking about the importance of treating everybody with respect during a time yeah. when you yourself were not treated the same. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, say, uh, uh, look, looking back, to me, the, the, were the three levels in my life that, that I have mentioned, the folks, uh, as a youngster, the family, you know, just treat other folks like you want to be treated. Uh, the scout experience and what it meant to share in, in, in that program and then later in, in my college years to join the fraternity but one of the precepts is to be first of all you must also be a servant of all and again that that means you take care of those coming along behind you don't let somebody fall off the wayside if you can help you, you do that and so those two things alone were, were also a part of my experience to stay on the positive side of life. And when, when, uh, so you, after, obviously after World War II, uh, and you kind of explain where you went after that, then mm -hmm. the Korean War uh, started soon to follow, and you yeah. went over to Korea. Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting, and as I say, along the way, I got assignments without asking for it, um, I left Riverside, the, the first fighter group was there and the bomb group was there and they were going to move the first fighter group to another base and originally I was to move with them, but then the word came that they needed maintenance officers in the Philippines, so I was changed and went to the Philippines. Got over there, they didn't need maintenance officers, I was signed in base ops, but two weeks later, we declared support for South Korea. Yeah. The 18th fighter group there in the Philippines had just given P-51s to Philippine Air Force and were flying F-80s. Although I wasn't in the group at the time, they immediately pulled two of the three squadrons to go up to Japan because they had stored a lot of 51s there. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of as I say, they grabbed P-51 pilots wherever you were. I was immediately <laughs> put in one of the squadrons, um, uh, 67th, 12th and 67th squadrons, went up to Japan, picked up P-51s, and we actually flew missions out of Japan before they finished their first trip inside Busan, Peru. Interesting. Yeah, and so on. So I went up as a maintenance officer and Lou Seville, our commander, lost his life on the mission, uh, and so I moved up from maintenance to ops. The ops also took command of the, the squadron. But while flying and flew 100 missions there, but halfway through the, almost a year, well, we went up in August of 50, so January 51, we had 100 missions. But I had received a spot promotion that was confirmed to major, returned and said, I could have come home, but I said, I'd like to go to the Philippines because they'd reopen family travel and enjoy an overseas tour. That's what I, I think the only time that I had asked for something in Simon was I did rather than come back to the States to go back to the Philippines. Um, and because of promotion, I ended up being made commander of the squadron of Maine, the 44th, for, for two years here I am. First jet experience, wonderful flying, 
and commanding a incredible <laughs> a, a, a unit, and uh, we had a wonderful two years there. Came back, went to command staff school, ended up in the F-89 outfit up in Minnesota, but again, um, transferred because of need of maintenance officer in headquarters, so, and that was the 10th Air Force at the time, we can end at Richard Guevara Air Base south of Kansas City. Yeah. Um, so back to that assignment, uh, and, um, that makes the second time that I'm <laughs> at Richard's, Richard's Guevara, but uh, then got called to, uh, again, how I was picked or why, I don't know, but we had a cadre leave the States to go overseas to APO, un APO unknown. We didn't know, so we ended up in Germany waiting, but what it turned out was they were negotiating of where they were going to locate the Jupiter missile. Uh, the decision hadn't been made. So we're in Germany, um, and finally they said, well, we've been there long enough. that say, we need to make you folks permanent party rather than paying you for being. They did that. And he said, well, if you do that, we should be able to get families overseas. They said, yes, that's correct. So we have our families coming over. Lo and behold, two months later, Jupiter missiles are going to Italy. So our families are coming into Germany. We're going, <laughs> going to Italy. <laughs> going to, to Italy. But finally, we got all of that worked out. And although we had to fly our youngsters Back then, the high school was in France. There was one in Germany and one in France, but from Italy, with our, our students were there. But again, I'm flying the kids to school, supply pickup, but I was deputy commander of the support squadron. Commander, the other lieutenant colonel that was there with us moved up to headquarters in we spot an area of Germany, and uh, I took over command, so another two years of wonderful experience yeah, and so on. Uh, um, there, uh, it's, so I've had the Cold War experience, let's say fortunately we didn't fire anything, so they sure. didn't the say That's credit. a good thing. So, exactly right, but that didn't happen. But coming, ba coming back, uh, after that, uh, well, let's see, my third experience getting back, um, well, the way Vietnam turned out was that, uh, this is after the Cold War experience, they established two new squadrons for tactical intelligence. And, uh, uh, this included the officers for flying and the technicians okay. and, and all. We went in the, in the Carolina to school, went out to Mountain Home, Idaho to get in the aircraft. And uh, I took the 16th Squadron to Vietnam and the other Lieutenant Colonel took the, uh, I think it was 12th, Squadron to Thailand, but we'd all gone through school, training overseas to the Philippines, and then to our assignments again along the way. Besides our technical activity, going through winter survival here in the states and jungle survival yeah. <laughs> in the Philippines, but again a, a great experience and. Uh, I'm still enjoying flying, and uh, when I finished my 173, my uh, assignment was for a year in Vietnam, and I had 173 missions uh, in that year. And when I finished, I was assigned to Eastern Seventh Army 
as an air liaison officer. Got promoted out of that job. Was enjoying it, but got promoted to full colonel, and that moved me to the 50th Attack Fighter Wing at Han Air Base in Germany. So I'm, and we had three squadrons. Uh, the wild weasel version of the aircraft, the air defense version of the aircraft in the tactical fighter version yeah. of the aircraft. I was assigned to the 10th tactical fighter for my continued flying. But that ended out of what becomes one of the, one of the war stories, if you will. Uh, a pilot attached to a fighter group in England flew to the Swybrook in Germany in a F-4 and landed gear up and grounded everybody throughout wow. <laughs> Europe. And as they reviewed and they said, well, why are you still flying? I said, nobody's ever told me to quit. <laughs> they said, you're through. <laughs> so I could have gotten, had I been there through that assignment, I'd have gotten 28 years in. <laughs> so that, that, <laughs> That that guy that guy that landed with the gear up ultimately ended your ability to to continue to continue, continue flying. flying. But oh I continued gosh. in maintenance assignments. Coming home, uh, I was assigned uh, to a unit that was in Illinois, but was moving to Richard Gabar Air Base. So this is my third assignment back. <laughs> South of Kansas City, um, also, and they, they were, this gave me a little touch of the first early maintenance in the space program, but then uh, the commander of the unit was the one that uh, said, uh, well, it gave me my final assignment as commander of Richard Gubar Air Base in the 1840th Air Base in Maine. And uh, enjoying that, uh, but then came the uh, retirement notice. <laughs> they had mandatory dates, and I don't know what set them up. Well, it was a date uh, so many years um, on active duty. Yeah, I think it was because I had reserve assignments until about 1959 and although I had earlier applied for permanent assignment never heard got no answer yeah 1959 they get their offering to as a lieutenant colonel to me when I said how you don't turn something down <laughs> like this along the way. Um, but it, if if I had not made full colonel regular, it would have been a mistake. But the fact that I did kept things <laughs> yeah. in line for retirement and all of that and what, what, what that meant. So, as I say, when I was called after two years at the University of Illinois, sometime later, of course, to the service support programs, I ended up going ahead and finishing two years of study and getting a degree in that uh, from Columbia College in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, so, because I'd always told the kids, you know, get your education. I said, well, I'd better go out and sure. <laughs> do what it's I said myself. and. So it was a few years later, but that's that's always been a good experience, uh, and I still stay in touch with the college and the activities that 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 that's meant. And so I was kind of speaking or attending air shows like Oshkosh and, sure. and so on keeps me out of the rocking chair. That's, <laughs> well, I I uh, first of all you. You you appear to be about fifty, <laughs> if that, and I understand you have a pretty significant birthday coming I got up. Got the big ninety nine uh, 
that last year and got a Honda jet ride the day after. I read about that. that <laughs> And I was, I was great. <laughs> I heard about. I, I heard you were flying, and you oh, were. Oh yes, you, they let me fly. It, uh, uh, learned a couple things on the way down. We flew from uh, uh, down to the beach area and had lunch, and then flew back to D.C. Uh, great, great experience. But again, technology because in the, there, get in and sit down. Punch a button. It's all done for and you. Sit back. <laughs> Engine start. <all. laughs> it's a little different than. Oh my goodness! But still, it's nice to be in the air and, and, and fly. But I guess yeah. What What are your plans for this December? Do you well, have any the plans? The kids have decided to have a party and got some friends being invited to town. So uh, they're we're trying to work out a activity at uh, um, far as I know the planning right now is going to be at College Park Airport. Okay, wonderful. Um, this, uh, my birthday this year will be Saturday, but they're doing this on Sunday so some folks could be available, not tied up with work or whatever. So they aren't telling me much, but except don't go anywhere. <laughs> Did uh do you re do you remember your first combat mission? Do you remember where it was, and do you remember what you felt and all that kind of stuff? The first uh, time you ever flew. Not not with specifics and so on, but but in a way, yes, because uh, we uh, routine certainly was established. That we got. Awaken pretty early in the morning to have breakfast and um, go to a briefing on the mission. And of course, you, you always look the board to see if you're on the assignment sure. list. <laughs> uh, after the briefing, go get all your personal equipment together. And everything then was based on your start engine time to be able to tax out and take off in times because you had a rendezvous time and and point to join up with the in the air. In the air. So you bat everything is backed off from that to even start start in some time. Of course we wanted to get out and after the briefing to chat with the crew chief and check the aircraft over. Everything was based ba based on time. As so I recall Call our first mission was my first one was got some target in nor very northern part of Italy. Okay. Later it was east Czechoslovakia. Yeah. All the way to the oil fields as farthest east that we went, and of course north into Germany, north west into southern in southern France. Yeah. And it was like on, on the D-Day event, we had several days of targeting the Germans that were in the southern part of France to keep them from backing up. Reinforcing. The, 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 right, reinforcing the D-Day folks. Um, did you fly when you were, how did it, how did it work when you would fly a mission? Would they give you a few days off? Or did they? We kind of, I think, they depended. But normally, we would have a sometime fly two days in a row, have a couple of days off, and about every three months have a week at the rest camp. Okay. And again, as I say, segregation went overseas. The officers rest camp was Isla Capri. Not for us. We ended up with a villa. Um, overlooking the Naples Harbor, but yeah. at, at, at the time, um, did uh, and you were you were stationed at an air base in Italy during that time. Exactly. When I mentioned when the 99th moved out of uh, Sicily into Italy, the group ended up come, going directly to to Italy. Um, although our boat 
boats, a couple of the boats uh, went into Naples Harbor. The boat I was on went into uh, over in the boot hill and we were trucked over the hills uh, to the strip that we had south of Naples. And of course that was just almost like a big open field. <laughs> yeah. And then later we went to Cappadocino Airport, so we actually had a runway <laughs> right. rather than field operation. Uh, in Tent City, you learn to uh, take an old oil can and make your little furnace for keeping <laughs> warm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> It's cold. It was colder than hell over there that oh year, wasn't goodness, it? Yes, indeed. Uh, so lots of rain. So you had muddy days and all, but we focus was on the task, and they didn't. You just stood up to whatever it took to sure <laughs> to, to to make it and be there. Uh, missions I really appreciate. Of course, our longest missions were to the escorting bombers to Puerto the oil field. I had come home because the group's longest mission was just before the war ended, flying from Italy to, to, to the, the bombers were bombing Berlin just before the end there, but I had come home. Of course, that's spring of 45. I came home late November of 44. But uh, of the missions I really enjoyed too, although they were highly classified at the time, we escorted some couple of special escort missions where they had working with the partisans in repatriating uh, down crewmen that had been protected by the partisans and getting them back to home. Um, of course, the missions were so highly classified, no, <laughs> nothing ever talked about sure. that, that, that much of the time. But later, to learn what was accomplished and and how and being a part of it was certainly makes you feel good to Absolutely. know that you helped. How much did you know at that time when you were flying the missions? Very little. <laughs> Almost nothing other than that you knew what you were rendezvous point was, what the target area was, and the task to do the job as long as you had fuel to do it. And we did a lot of that, of course, some aircraft, and, and of course that was the thing, I always salute the bomber pilots, because once they got on the bomb run, uh, they couldn't move out of that black blanket much, and many times where they'd lose an engine or something, and, we would dispatch an element to stay as long as we had fuel to stay with a straggler and hope until they Protect got it. clear of the defended areas. Um, so there were some interesting, interesting moments, but as I say, I always salute the burning pilots because we could see where the flak blanket was going to be and we could steal our job and climb another 500 sure. feet or 1,000 feet even and still do the job. Sure. And that, made a difference in to see them because they had uh, I got what they were they call them the bomb leaders so, but they had one aircraft that and everybody other, the other bombers followed them and once you could see that flat coming up but they couldn't move because that was all planned to they had to stay in formation stay in formation and get the bombs on the target uh, and so that, I'm sure, it was quite a task for the navigator on those bombers to be sure that they're in line and the bombs are going to fall on the target as planned, and that quite a deal. What were the heaviest flak areas that you can remember? Do you remember any specific areas? Was it Germany itself that was the heaviest? No, the heaviest I remember seeing was the Ploesti oil field. Areas. But most of our targets in Germany were chemical plants okay. or, or aircraft factory Understood. location. Uh, so, it, as I say, the mission was to d destroy Germany's war-making potential. Yeah. And so, well, the, 
And of course, by going to the oil fields, uh, we had non-escort missions, we called them, we were assigned fighter sweeps. We probably destroyed more German aircraft on the ground when they didn't have fuel and oil to get in the air than we did in the air. Yeah. Uh, I just had one victory in August of 44 over part of BG Aerodrome. My element was dispatched because of Folk Wolf trying to penetrate the bomber stream and he tried to dive away, but I was able to get on his tail and he just made a turn the wrong direction. I said, put him in my gun sights and the plane crashed on the aerodrome. But Did, uh, <clears throat> how long was, was your longest mission, do you think? I mean, how many hours were you in the air? Uh, on? A little over four and a half. Wow, that's hours. a long time. Yes, it is, yeah. The average was probably just under four hours. And of course, the shortest mission was probably one that's only two hours and something. Wow. But that's, that's when they had missions in northern Italy before sure. Germans were pushed completely out of Italy. And that some of were first part of Yugoslavia. Did um, after after the war, um, and I, I'm, I'm asking this because uh, a lot of the guys that I served with after the war, they struggled a little bit when they came back home. Did you go through any of that, or did your friends? I didn't do it, but two things. I was young, so I was asked, were you scared? And I said, no, if you're scared, you're in the wrong position. Sure. <laughs> wrong mission. Uh, training was good, and it was, uh, fortunately, they didn't change the standards for our training, and we had good training. and. We had fortunate enough folks that uh, believed in the opportunity. They didn't change the segregation, but believed in the opportunity, and that paid off um, in it. But I uh, just, as they have to answer the youngsters, they were you scared. No. If training was good, there was nothing to be scared about. <laughs> out. You should do what you're doing, Todd. Exactly. What <laughs> and uh, I'm sure there were some cases. Uh, that uh, they, well, they called it fatigue or what they want, but some pilots were pulled out of combat because of not being able to react to. But I have never had a mission or something where that is, you know, say I was scared or. <laughs> Just did your. No, boy, that's right. Just. <laughs> You did your job, what you right. were. So I had 82 tactical and 54 strategic missions. And uh, fortunately lived through all of them. <laughs> What's the difference, or what was the difference at that time between tactical and strategic? Well, we were with 12th Air Force and that's when we had the P-39. Yeah. The strategic missions were the, were the, the those where we had the escort and fighter sweeps. Okay. Uh, even in, late in the war, of course, I'd come home, but in 45, I know some, rather than full squadron escorts, there were a couple of P-38 units there, but they were doing reconnaissance more than the other work like the, the P-51 groups were doing. And I know yes. late in the war, the group even occasionally had a, just a four-ship Sometimes there's two escorting a uh, uh, reconnaissance spread. Yeah. On on an average mission, uh, how many bombers were in the air? You said, uh, well, I, I think you, uh, it would be how many squadrons. I think they usually a squadron of bombers would be twelve. And how many fighters <laughs> would uh, uh, we each squadron put up sixteen aircraft? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And then we would divide maybe one squadron on this side of the group, one this side. Uh, we, as I say, fortunately we could be in the B-17s would climb higher because that helped get sure. out of the, the blanket, uh, flak blanket, uh, we, we could join them. Probably the most difficult uh, to assure coverage 
was if they got spread out. And that happened sometimes. It broke so formation. It made, made, made uh, the work difficult. But fortunately, the research has shown that way back somebody made a statement that we had never lost a bomber, and that's not a correct statement. I just tell folks if you're going to use the word never, qualify it. <laughs> and it turns out from the research that we never lost a bomber in 172 escort missions. That's a good statement. Yep. We flew 179 yeah. missions. Um, and uh, there were some losses, but even there, uh, it, it's hard to say where were the losses. Yeah. You know, some of them could have been after the escort was open. Something, something happened over the target area that still, but uh, all the, you know, that's where all the losses weren't always attributed to a German aircraft sure. causing it. Sure. But there's been a lot of research on that and still looking at mission reports. And then the, uh, sometimes I could say, how accurate, how complete. How, sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, how many miles were you talking about spread out? <laughs> and it's interesting for the group of. Uh, they flew one of the longest missions just before the war ended, but it was to, from Italy to to Berlin. Wow. But the group uh, was assigned for penetration escort and was to be relieved by another bomb group for over the target. The other bomb group didn't show. Wow, so they had and, to keep going. And, but fortunately, and again, it's another thing, the night before the mission, the maintenance folks found out about some larger tanks wow. being available and went and got some and had them on the aircraft. And and them. To, so how things can happen, they didn't know. <laughs> they had no idea. <laughs> they going to pay off. Extended. No, but just <laughs> that happened. And, uh, and then the group shot down uh, three of the uh, German jets that were put up in the defense of Berlin. No kidding. And the, uh, th I think the 31st fighter group shot down some too. They were also you know, in a different segment of the sure. mission, but. Uh, what a feat of, what a feat of of, of happenstance or whatever expert what I, I mean to shoot down uh, because those jets were oh, several fast. hundred miles per hour oh yeah faster and so on but of course they were trying to defend plus by that time too but in this you get from the history stories and so on most of the experienced German officers were gone that's true at that time and, and of course the plane was new even to them and to be and it turns out that those early aircraft weren't made of the same material that they do yeah. to today so it's happenstance and circumstance that uh, just made a difference uh, who knows what would have been had it not been that way as you progress so once once the Air Force separated from the Army and integrated, and then President Truman uh, gave the executive order for everybody to integrate, yes. did you notice uh, at that point as you move forward through your career, did, it, did things get better, or was, was there always pressure? Uh, I didn't feel it so much as pressure. There, there were always circumstances that uh, well, it's like saying things improved, but it took the civil rights actions of the 60s before things got better, if it Understood. in a way. In those traveling across the country, where could you get a motel room, even though the sign says vacancy, they weren't vacant for a black family traveling. And I've, I've often felt that uh, the experiences of the 70s 
sergeants and folks at that level, and particularly when they were assigned to places in the South, uh, experiences were not very pleasant in many cases. When you look at the need for schooling for the children, and yeah. that, that, that type of thing, and uh, uh, it's, well, I can remember even traveling at, you know, when you go to a room, you drive a little farther down, finally find a place, but usually it was one not very well kept and so on, because I can even remember my wife cleaning floors before she'd let the kids get in and crawl around <laughs> and that type of thing, and uh, because it was always, you know, second class and not... Sure. Yeah. I... I uh, really, really admire everything that, um, that that you did, and you're the, the, probably one of the most amazing things to me is your just your attitude about everything. You yeah. talked about being positive and yeah. your leadership philosophies, and and well, thank you for the comment. I appreciate it, but it's as I say, I've just what keeps me going now is to pass on value lessons for our youngsters because so many of them need it. Uh, that uh, for the future, you have no idea what they face, but know there's difficulties, and but just get a positive attitude on life, and <laughs> that'll take you a long way. Yes. <laughs> what do you What do you aside from flying? What do you enjoy doing? What are your hobbies? Do you watch sports? Do you... Yeah. Well, pretty much now I. I can remember they, basketball to me was a non-contact sport, <laughs> not today, <laughs> uh, things, um, but I've gotten so I don't have favorites anymore, I like to see good games, good refereeing, whether it's football or basketball, love to, and I played golf, and I loved the out of doors until my back finally said, no, stop. <laughs> um, but we still uh, still enjoy watching golf, uh, but still love the out of doors and you know nicely manicured golf course, the trees, sure. the flowers, and, and then uh, concerned with the skills of the players. <laughs> and what's the win today? <laughs> do you, do you watch uh, the NBA basketball or college or? I've any slowed preference? down on the basketball because. As I made, unfortunately, too many calls are missed, and yeah. and, and uh, the refereeing isn't up to date. Uh, well, it's all sometimes happening in foot football too. Uh, uh, so I I don't because of the change in the sport. I just very don't watch much basketball at all. We'll watch some football, and still love to. Watch golf just because of the beauty of the outdoors, sure. the fairways. <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> I a, a good a good friend of mine. You know, I live in San Antonio. Oh, uh, okay. In Texas, and and uh, a good friend of mine is Coach Popovich from the San Antonio Spurs. Oh, wow! wow. And, what and, a neat uh, deal. <laughs> he's a really really good guy. Wonderful. And, and he has a very. Uh, you know, he was in the Air Force for a short period himself. Oh, okay. He went. He went to the Air Force Academy, and he Wonderful. he has a very um, good attitude. Huh? Very, he loves <laughs> military guys, and he loves you know <laughs> veterans uh, like yourself. How nice! Yeah. But yeah. I, I how, how long have you lived here in Bethesda? Twenty three years now. Well, what what ninety? This nineteen. Yeah, I came. We really moved in. January '96. Well, a week after it was just after Christmas '95. Wow. It came, but I still kind of consider Kansas City, Missouri, home because of my service there and retirement. Sure. In fact, my last paying job, I managed the Kansas City downtown airport for ah. a period. One day, the wife said she'd like to go fishing more often. I said, "Well, I don't need to be punching clock." That's true. <laughs> So I uh, changed that, but after she passed, I just realized I didn't have fa any family within 500 miles, and that was too far to drive in one day. Sure. So looked around, ended up coming here with my daughter, Ken, 
get her off the siege coast. She's very busy. In fact, she's out. In fact, she's, I think, at a medical appointment. She ought to be showing up here yeah. before long. How many we, children? How many well, children? We raised three children, but I've been blessed with ten grandchildren. Wow. Fourteen great grandchildren, and now one great great granddaughter. Wow. Uh, she's well. She's probably nine months old, coming up on me, close to a year. But, you know, life, that's why I say life's been a blessing. But uh, my oldest daughter, she's the one that wrote the, my story in the book that we have. Um, well, she still lives in Ohio. She and her husband both worked at Ohio University and retired. My son, uh, that's one of our life stories. When he graduated from high school, we were in Missouri. And it was the time that I was commander of Richard Gabar Air Base. But he had a high school counselor tell him, he and his mother, that he'd probably make a good truck driver. He had had an interest in aviation. I wasn't at the time aware of how much, but went to Kansas University and got an aerospace space engineering degree wow. and is now retired with over 30,000 hours. Holy cow. And he was with Continental for many, many years and then of course you know they combined United. With, with United. Yeah. And right now he's in Tokyo, Japan because a couple of uh, Boeing retired captains have been rehired to bring their pilots on board the Dreamliner and Triple Seven. Sure. So that's where he is. He's still doing flying. And after all of it, he was in the service for a few years, but wanted more high performance time because he wanted to try to qualify for the astronaut program, but they wanted him to stay in the OV-10. Yeah. He got out, but couldn't have been and a better opportunity for his commercial career. So again, how things can happen and the results is often, you don't have an answer, but his is one that uh, he got in at a time that really paid off for his, his career. And he may, after retirement, what he bought himself a long easy. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. It's been interesting to us because apparently it's been a maintenance activity too because he, <laughs> yeah. he's a fixer as well and is really in maintenance. We kind of kidding him and said, well, you can get your mechanic's license now. <laughs> <laughs> you get plenty of hours. <laughs> plenty, oh, <my. laughs> plenty of hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, I have one more question for you. Yes. And as I always, everybody, every veteran that I meet, uh, that was that fought in World War II. I have this question, and I ask this question. You know, you look at what we were up against during that time as a nation yes. and as the Allies, and we were facing one of the most powerful militaries at the time that mm -hmm. the world had ever seen. How do you think we we mustered up the strength to to go to a foreign land to fight these folks on their own soil? Yeah. How do you think we did it? I look at it and I've often said that when our country determined to support our allies in Europe, the country was coming out of 10 years of depression. And as I've said, it didn't change segregation, but everybody came ahead of Came, had, came together behind that activity. The job opportunities that the war built up made available, the enlistments to support different uh, parts of our, our military structure. It brought the country together in a focus that everybody supported. And certainly they uh, sharing with the Allies in Europe, of course, another part of things going. 
Um, so I think it was a fortunate, fortunate bit of circumstances that brought things together in a successful way. And to me, sometimes it emphasized we did it in a way and we did what it was necessary to win. Korea, still divided country. Vietnam, not a pleasant experience. What we're doing now, I say, it's, to me, it's just unfortunate that uh, um, that focus is, isn't there in a way to have the same results. Yeah, I understood. Yeah, and that's kind of the way I see it. When, Unfortunate lives are being lost, and that's very regrettable. What it means, and and that's the other part of being able to mentor young folks with the, with what's going on. It's very difficult to keep them focused on the positive. I had a lot of a lot of my soldiers when we were in combat. A lot of my soldiers would ask me. They would say, you know, sir, why why are we here? What are we doing? What's our purpose? You know, they're not stupid because they can read. Exactly. You know, now with the internet, you can they can oh, good, good. go on and read anything from anybody. And uh, it was difficult to answer, to be honest with you. No question. That's what it says. Getting it's, harder and harder to mentor. And, I, and that same way you can say harder and harder on the leaders. Yeah. Because, well... You don't have the answer, so how do you put something <laughs> right now. in their minds to keep them focused <laughs> on what you, where you'd like them to be? A lot of pretty picture in this day and age. When uh, when you came home, when when you came home from from the war from World War Two, where did you come home to? Where was your first uh, point of arrival back to the U.S.? Our first arrival was in in the New York area. Uh, the you know doc in New York uh, brought a car home. Uh, when did you see your wife? When did you see your wife for the first time? Uh, she was able to come. They gave us a week at a rest camp, and it was in New Jersey. Where the boardwalk is, ah. and we had maids in the hotel. Soon, the first time the black was sleeping in the hotel. <laughs> wow! Because of those areas were not available. Sure. At, at that time, but a week there. But again, it was one small step and. <laughs> A change that took took time and evaluation. Well, I, I again your your attitude and your the way that you view the world and the way that you describe things is is amazing because you've been through a lot and your 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 men and women that you fought alongside have been through a lot. Yeah. And the fact that you're you're so positive about things to me is it's amazing. Yeah. I've <laughs> often said I can't say anything good about segregation, then I say, oh, well, I better modify that a little bit, because the fact that because of segregation, our circumstances from 41 to 49, supporting each other, going through training, accomplishing uh, something that was meaningful to the country, uh, we developed like lifelong friends out of that so you can't overlook that for sure that's amazing <laughs> togetherness that that meant support for each other and i can even but thinking back on training now there are many that uh, we got no folks by nickname but had no idea what their real name was and so on you know because we had uh, smirk and smith and jelly butt smith and so on and so on or you knew somebody just the way they walked down the ramp carrying their parachute, had no idea who they were. So, so there were folks before you knew names, but not them personally, and 
folks after the, the life's been interesting. <laughs> Do you, uh, are there many guys that are still still alive from your unit? Do you stay in touch with any of them? I'm the last living pilot of the 302nd that got overseas. Really? Uh, and of all the pilots that got overseas, which is, I think, just over 350, uh, we're down to 10 or 11. I'm the oldest at 99, and the youngest is George Hardy at 94. Um, but that's, and we've only been able to seem to track the pilots of all of them. You know, there's a program to produce just over 900 pilots, but when you look at all the support people to maintain segregation and all of the skills, it's probably about 14,000 people. Wow. Total. And those, and a lot of the maintenance guys aren't tracked. It, the support, they have no way to no, keep up support with or so on. They, uh, they, so many support people came and go in different phases. And, well, I got there, folks, when they first authorized the 99th Pursuit Squadron with all necessary support. Squadron was 34 pilots, 24 aircraft, all your maintenance and technician skills, about 200. But when you need medical, communication, supply, administration, almost another 200. Um, and then this doesn't even move over into the field maintenance level of support. Um, the folks that, uh, engine change, uh, you know, that level of material support. Sure. Um, nobody kept a finger on all these people. <laughs> the number of replacements that came in and worse, but so I say is, some 14,000 people were also involved uh, for things to be successful. That's amazing. Yeah. Are those all your coins over there? That's, you know, I've got a few more. But <laughs> That's a lot of coins. <laughs> so still, in the fact, I brought two home from the trip we just got, got off of. That's very popular today, folks, to pass on a, pass on a coin to... Of remembrance in that. Sure. <laughs> Did do you travel a lot? Do you travel? Uh, things are slowing down, but I uh, made you know like the Ice Cars Air Show had an invitation. Well, we just came back to the uh, commemorative services over in Virginia Beach area. Um, in fact, that was really related to the arrival of the first slaves that were brought to the United States. Wow. 400 years as of the 19th. Uh, and it was, uh, so 2019, it was 1619. Wow. And, but uh, I still got a couple of invitations to activities. Uh, most of the related to aviation still support uh, the commemorative Red Tail Squadron of the Commemorative Air Force is very active and frequently well they have a, one of the few P-51C models still flying, um, keeping in there going but They've been fortunate to have a couple folks in an educational trailer. They drive to air show or a school area and park, and they can expand the trailer and show a widescreen movie, but but with lessons of you know be prepared, uh, believe that you can, expect to win, type of thing, passing on. The past experience, and as, as I've said, the value lessons that helped us are good for the young folks today. So <laughs>